In the Time of the Butterflies by Julia Alvarez, Part 1, Chapter 2, Part B, Pobrecitas, 1941. The country people around the farm say that until the nail is hit, it doesn't believe in the hammer. Everything Sunita said I filed away as a terrible mistake that wouldn't happen again. Then the hammer came down hard, right in our own school, right on Lena Lovaton's head. Except she called it love and went off, happy as a newlywed. Lena was a couple of years older than Elsa, Lord, Sunita, and me, but her last year at Amakalada, we were all in the same dormitory hall of the 15s through 17s. We got to know her and love her, which amounted to the same thing when it came to Lena Lovaton. We all looked up to her as, she, as if she were a lot older than even the other 17s. She was a grown-up looking for her age, tall, with red-gold hair and her skin like something just this moment coming out of the oven, giving off a warm, golden glow. Once, when Elsa pestered her in the washroom while Sora Socorro was over at the convent, Lena slipped off her gown and showed us what we would look like in a few years. She sang in the choir in a clear, beautiful voice like an angel. She wrote in a curly-cued a uh, curly-cued hand that was like the old prayer books with silver clasps Sora Suncion had, had brought over from Spain. Lena taught us how to roll our hair and how to curtsy if we met a king. We watched her. All of us were in love with our beautiful Lena. The nuns loved her too, always choosing Lena to read the lessons during silent dinners or to carry the Virgin Sita in the sodality of the merry processions. As often as my sister Patria, Lena was awarded the weekly good conduct ribbon, and she wore it proudly, bandolier style, across the front of her blue serge uniform. I still remember the afternoon it all started. We were outside playing volleyball, and our Captain Lena was leading us to victory. Her thick, pleated hair was coming undone, and her face was pink and flushed as she flung herself here and there after the ball. Sor Socorro came hurrying out. Lena Lovaton had to come right away. An important visitor was here to meet her. This is very unusual since we weren't allowed weekday visitors and the sisters were very strict about their rules. Off Lena went, Sor Socorro straightening her hair ribbons and pulling at the pleats of her uniform to make the skirt fall straight. The rest of us resumed our game, but it wasn't as much fun now that our beloved captain was gone. When Lena came back, there was a shiny medal pinned on her uniform just above her left breast. We crowded around her, wanting to know all about her important visitor. Trujillo? We all cried, cried out. Trujillo came to see you? Sor Socorro rushed out for a second time that day, hushing and rounding us up. We had to wait until lights out that night to hear Lena's story. It turned out that Trujillo had been visiting some official's house next door, and attracted by the shouts from our volleyball game below, he had gone out on the balcony. When he caught sight of our beautiful Lena, he walked right over to the school, followed by his surprised aides, and insisted on meeting her. He wouldn't take no for an answer. Sor Sincion finally gave in and sent, to, and sent for Lena Lovaton. Uh, soldiers swarmed about them, Lena said, and Trujillo took a medal off his own uniform and pinned it on hers. What did you do? We all wanted to know. In the moonlight, Streaming in from the open shutters, Lena Lovatone showed us. Lifting the mosquito net, she stood in front of us and made a deep curtsy. Soon, every time Trujillo was in town, and he was in La Vega more often than he had ever been before, he stopped in to visit Lena Lovatone. Gifts were sent over to the school, a porcelain ballerina, little bottles of perfume that looked like pieces of jewelry and smelled like a rose garden, wished it could smell, a satin box with a gold heart charm inside for a bracelet that Trujillo had given her with a big L charm to start, to start it off. At first the sisters were frightened, but then they started receiving gifts too. Bolts of muslin for making convent sheets and terry cloth for their towels and a donation of a thousand pesos for a new statue of the merciful mother to be carved by a Spanish artist living in the capital. Lena always told us about her visits from Trujillo. It was kind of exciting for all of us when he came. First, classes were canceled and the whole school was overrun by guards poking through all of our bedrooms. When they were done, they stood at attention while we tried to tease smiles out of their 
on guard faces. Meanwhile, Lena disappeared into the parlor where we had all been delivered that first day by our mothers. As Lena reported, the visit usually started with Trujillo reciting some poetry to her, then saying something, saying that he had some surprise on his person she had to find. Sometimes he'd asked her to sing or dance. Most especially, he loved for her to play the play with the medals on his chest, taking them off, pinning them back on. But do you love him? Sunita asked Lena one time. Sunita's voice sounded as disgusted as if it were asking Lena if she'd fallen in love with a tarantula. With all my heart, Lena sighed, more than my life. Trujillo kept visiting Lena and sending her gifts and love notes and that she shared with us. Except for Sunita, I think we were all falling in love with the phantom hero in Lena's sweet and simple heart. From the back of my drawer, where I'd put her away in consideration for Sunita, I dug up the little picture of Trujillo we were all given in citizenship class. I placed it under my pillow at night to ward off nightmares. For her 17th birthday, Trujillo threw Lena a big party in a new house he had just built outside Santiago. Lena went away for the whole week of her birthday. On the actual day, a full-page photograph of Lena appeared in the papers, and beneath it was a poem written by Trujillo himself. She was born a queen, not by dynastic right, but by the right of beauty, whom divinity sends to the world only rarely. Sunita claimed that someone else had written it for him because Trujillo hardly knew how to scratch out his own name. If I were Lena, she began, and her right hand reached out as if grabbing a bunch of grapes and squeezing the juice out of them. Weeks went by and Lena didn't return. Finally, the sisters made an announcement that Lena Lovaton would be granted her diploma by government orders in absentia. Why? we asked Sor Milagros, who is still our favorite. Why won't she come back to us? Sor Milagros shook her head and turned her face away, but not before I had seen tears in her eyes. That summer I found out why. Papa and I were on our way to Santiago with the delivery of tobacco in the wagon. He pointed out at a high iron gate, and beyond it, a big mansion with lots of flowers and the hedges all cut to look like animals. Look, Minerva, one of Trujillo's girlfriends lives there, your old schoolmate, Lena Lovaton. Lena? My breath felt tight inside my chest as if I couldn't get it out. But Trujillo is married, I argued. How can he have Lena as his girlfriend? Papa looked at me a long time before he said, He's got many of them, all over the island, set up in big fancy houses. Lena Lovaton is just a sad case, because she really does love him, pobrecita. Right there, he took the opportunity to lecture me why the hens shouldn't wander away from the safety of the barnyard. Back at school in the fall, during one of our nightly sessions, the rest of the story came out. Lena Lovaton had gotten pregnant in the big house. Trujillo's wife, Doña Maria, had found out and gone after her with a knife, so Trujillo shipped Lena off to a mansion that he bought for her in Miami where she knew she'd be safe. She lived all alone now, waiting for him to call her up. I guess there was a whole uh, there was a whole other pretty girl now taking up his I guess there was a whole other pretty girl now taking up his attention. Pobrecita, we chorused like an amen. <laughs> we were quiet, thinking of this sad ending for our beautiful Lena. I felt my breath coming short again. At first, I thought it was caused by the cotton bandages I had just started tying around my chest so my breasts wouldn't grow. I wanted to be sure what had happened to Lena Lovatone would never happen to me. But every time I'd wear one more, se I'd hear one more secret about Trujillo. I couldn't feel the tightening in my chest even when I wasn't wearing the bandages. Trujillo is a devil, Sunita said as we tiptoed back to our beds. We had managed to get them side by side again this year. But I was thinking, no, he's a man, and in spite of all I'd heard, I felt sorry for him. Pobrecito! At night, he probably had nightmare after nightmare like I did, just thinking about what he'd done. Downstairs in the dark parlor, the clock was striking the hours like hammer blows. The Performance, 1944 It was our country's centennial year. We'd been having celebrations and performances ever since Independence Day, February 27th. Patria had celebrated her 20th birthday that day, and we'd thrown a big party for her at Ojo de Agua. 
That's how my family got around having to give some sort of patriotic affair to show their support for Trujillo. We pretended the party was in his honor with Patria dressed in white, her little boy Nelson in red, and Pedrito, her husband, in blue. Oh yes, the nun thing had fallen through. It wasn't just my family putting on a big loyalty performance, but the whole country. When we got to school that fall, we were issued new history textbooks with a picture of you-know-who embossed on the cover so even a blind person could tell who the lies were all about. <laughs> Our history now followed the plot of the Bible. We Dominicans had been waiting for centuries for the arrival of our Lord Trujillo on the scene. It was pretty disgusting. All through nature, there is a feeling of ecstasy. A strange, otherworldly light suffuses the house, uh, smelling of labor and sanctity. The 24th of October, 1891. God's glory made flesh in a miracle. Rafael Leonidas Trujillo had been born, has been born. At our first assembly, the sisters announced that, thanks to a generous donation from El Jefe, a new wing had been added to for indoor recreation. It was to be known as the Lina Lovaton Gymnasium, and in a few weeks, a recitation contest would be held there for the entire school. The theme was to be our centennial and the generosity of our gracious benefactor. At the announcement, as the announcement was being made, Sinita and Elsa and Lords and I looked at each other, settling what we would do. Uh, what we would do our entry together. We had all started out together at Amacalada six years ago, and everyone now called us the quadruplets. Sorsuncion was always joking that when we graduated in a couple of years, we were going to have to hack us apart with a knife. We worked hard on our performance, practicing every night after lights out. We had written all of our lines instead of just reciting things from a book. The way that, that way we could say the, what we wanted instead of what the censors said we could say. Not that we were stupid enough to say anything bad about the government. Our skit was set way back in the olden days. I played the part of the enslaved motherland, tied up during the whole performance until the end when liberty, glory, and the narrator untied me. This was supposed to remind the audience of our winning our independence a hundred years ago. Then we all sang the national anthem and curtsied like Lena Lovaton had taught us. Nobody could get upset with that. The night of the recitation contest, we could hardly eat our dinners. We were so nervous and excited. We dressed in one of the classrooms, helping each other with the costumes and painting our faces, for the sisters did uh, did allow makeup for performances. Of course, we never washed up real good afterwards, so that the next day we walked around with sexy eyes, rosy lips, and painted on beauty marks as if we were, you know what kind of place instead of a convent school. And the quadruplets were the best by far. We took so many curtain calls that we were still on stage when Sor Suncion came up to announce the winners. We started to exit, but she motioned us back. The place broke into wild clapping, stomping, whistling, all of which were forbidden as unladylike. But Sor Suncion seemed to have forgotten her own rules. She held up the blue ribbon since no one would quiet down to hear her announce that we had won. What we did hear her say when the audience finally settled down was that we would be sent along with a delegation from La Vega to the capital to perform the winning piece for Trujillo on his birthday. We looked at each other, shocked. The nuns had never said anything about this added performance. Later, as we undressed in the classroom, we discussed turning down the prize. I'm not going, I declared, washing off all the goop off my face. I wanted to make a protest, but I wasn't sure what to do. Let's do it, oh please, Sunita pleaded. That there was such a look of desperation on her face, Elsa and Lords readily agreed, let's. But they tricked us, I reminded them. Please, Minerva, please, Sunita coaxed. She put her arm around me, and when I tried to pull away, she gave me a smack on the cheek. I couldn't believe Sunita would really want to do this, given how her family felt about Trujillo. But Sunita, why would you want to perform for him? Sunita drew herself up, so proud she looked like Liberty, all right. It's not for him. Our play's about a time when we were free. It's like a hidden protest. That settled it. I agreed to go on the condition that we would do the skit dressed as boys. <laughs> At first, my friends grumbled because we had to change 
a lot of the feminine endings, and so the rhymes were all went to pot. But the nearer the big day approached, the more the specter of Lena haunted us as we did jumping jacks in the Lena Loveton gymnasium. Her beautiful portrait stared across the room at the picture of El Jefe on the opposite wall. We went down to the capital in the big car provided by the Dominican party in La Vega. On the way, Sora Sincion read us uh, the epistle, which is what she called the rules we were to observe. Ours was the third performance in the girls' school division. We would begin at five, and we would stay to the conclusion of the La Vega performances and be back at El Colegio for, bed for bedtime juice. You must show the nation you are its jewels, the Macalada Concepcion girls. Is that perfectly clear? Yes, Sor Asuncion, we chorused back absently, but we were too excited about our glorious adventure to pay much attention to rules. Along the way, every time some cute fellows passed us in their fast, fancy cars, we'd wave and pucker up our mouths. Once the car slowed, and the boys inside called out compliments. Sister scowled fiercely at them and turned around to see what was going on in the back seat of the car. We looked blithely at the road ahead, quadruple, quadruple angels. We didn't have to be in a skit to give our best performance. But as we neared the capital, Sinita got more and more quiet. There was a sad, wistful look on her face, and I knew who she was missing. Before long, we were waiting in the anteroom of the palace alongside other girls from schools all over the country. Sora Sinsuyon came in, swishing her habit importantly in motion for us. We were ushered into a large hall bigger than any room I'd ever been in. Uh, through a break in a row of chairs, we came to the center of the floor. We turned circles, trying to get our bearings. Then I recognized him under a canopy of Dominican flags, the benefactor I'd heard about all my life. In this big gold armchair, he looked much smaller than I had imagined him, looming as he always was from some wall or other. He was wearing a fancy white uniform with gold fringe epaulets and a breast of medals like an actor playing a part. We took our places, but he didn't seem to notice. He was turned towards a young man sitting beside him, also wearing a uniform. I knew it was his handsome son, Rumfis, a full colonel in the army since he was four years old. His picture was always in the papers. Rumfis looked our way and whispered something to his father, who laughed loudly. How rude, I thought. After all, we were to pay them uh, we were here to pay them compliments. The least they could do is pretend that we didn't look like fools in our ballooning togas and beards and bows and arrows. Trujillo nodded for us to start. We stood frozen, gawking, until Sunita finally pulled us all together by taking her place. I was glad I got to recline on the ground because my knees were shaking so hard I was afraid that the fatherland might faint right on the spot. Miraculously, we all remembered our lines. As we said them out loud, our voices gathered confidence and became more expressive. Once, when I stole a glance, I saw that the handsome Ramfis and even El Jefe were caught up in our performance. We moved along smoothly until we got to the part where Sunita was supposed to stand before me, the bound fatherland. After I said, Over a century languishing in change, dare I now hope for freedom from my woes. O oh, liberty, unfold your brilliant bow. Sunita was to step forward, show her brilliant bow, then having aimed imaginary arrows at imaginary foes, she was to set me free by untying me. But when we got to this part, Sunita kept on stepping forward and didn't stop until she was right in front of Trujillo's chair. Slowly, she raised her bow and took aim. There was a stunned silence in the hall. Quick as gunfire, Ramfis leapt to his feet and crouched between his father and our frozen tableau. He snatched the bow from Sunita's hand and broke it over his raised knee. The crack of the splintering wood released a hubbub of whispers and murmurs. Ramfis looked intently at Sunita, who glared right back at him. You shouldn't play that way. It was part of the play, I lied. I was still bound, reclined on the floor. She didn't mean any harm. Ramfis looked at me and then back at Sunita. What's your name? Liberty, Sunita said. Your real name, Liberty? He barked at her as if she were a soldier in his army. Peroso, she said it proudly. He lifted an eyebrow, intrigued. And then, like a hero in a storybook, he helped me up. 
Untie her, Poroso, he ordered Sunita. But when she reached over to work the knots loose, he grabbed her hands and yanked them behind her back. He spit these words out at her. Use your dog teeth, bitch! His lips twisted into a sinister little smile as Sunita bent down and untied me with her mouth. My hands freed, I saved the day according to what Sunita said later. I flung off my cape, showing off my pale arms and bare neck. In a trembly voice, I began the chant that grew into a shouting chorus. Viva Trujillo! Viva Trujillo! Viva Trujillo! On the way home, Sorasuncion scolded us. You are not the ornaments of the nation. You did not obey my epistle. <laughs> As the road darkened, the beams of our headlights filled with hundreds of blinded moths. Where they hit the windshield, they left blurry marks until it seemed like I was looking at the world through a curtain of tears.